I'm now going to talk about lutetium PSMA radial ligand therapy. So first, let's start off talking about what is theranostics, right? This is the idea of using a molecule for both imaging, diagnostics, and therapy, right? And in this example, on the blue side here, this is the binding portion of the molecule, the urea motif that binds to PSMA. On the opposite side of the molecule in red, this is the chelator, right? This is what carries the radio metal into the tumor, right? So you can either put gallium or copper for imaging in there, or for therapy, you could put lutetium or actinium to treat a patient. So we're using the same molecule for both imaging to select the patients and then subsequently to treat the patients with lutetium. This approach was evaluated in the vision trial. This was a randomized phase three study uh, in about 800 patients comparing lutetium PSMA 617 plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. Of note, there was no chemotherapy allowed in this trial, but the results demonstrated an improvement in progression-free survival with a pretty good odds ratio of 0.4. And then also you can see here an improvement in the overall survival with an odds ratio of 0.6. So the use of PSMA radio ligand therapy increased patients' lives, and there was no evidence of a negative impact on the quality of life. So this is what led to the approval of PSMA radio, uh, radio ligand therapy. Now that we've been using this, we see evidence of this efficacy. So here's a patient uh, who had on the left there a positive PSMA PET with both extensive nodal or osseous disease and some lymph nodes as well. The middle there, that's imaging after treatment one. We do treatment of the lutetium, so you can see where the radioactivity went in the patient. And then subsequently after treatment two, you can see the intensity went down dramatically with the first therapy. And that's borne out in a quote from this patient who said, before the first treatment, I had to be carried off the property and into the car. Couldn't even sit up in bed on my own. And after the treatment, after the second treatment, he said, hey, it's a godsend, as they say. I haven't felt better. He was able to walk to the car on his own and do what he was wanting to do with his life. Now, this is, I would say, an unusual response, very good response. But this is the type of response that is driving the interest in PSMA radio ligand therapy. And in March of this year, the FDA approved lutetium PSMA 617, which is brand name Pluvicto or Vipivotide, uh, as a therapy to treat patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who previously been treated with androcytin receptor pathway inhibitor, androgen receptor target therapy, and a taxane-based chemotherapy like docetaxel or cabazitaxel. The other trial I always like to talk about is the therapy trial. This was an academic study. So the vision trial was a company-sponsored trial that was done to gain approval of the agent. The therapy trial was an academic trial out of the Peter McCallum Institute in Australia. This was a randomized one-to-one 200-patient -one study, which was comparing lutetium PSMA 617, just like the vision trial, to cabazitaxel. So unlike the vision trial, this actually had an active comparator arm. So the treatment arm was lutetium PSMA 617, and cabazitaxel was on the therapy arm. Now, on the left here, the primary endpoint of the study was a PSA 50 response, right? So the PSA falling by at least 50%. And what's interesting is that actually the use of lutetium PSMA 617 resulted in nearly a doubling of the percent of patients whose PSA fell by 50%, okay? But interestingly, there was no significant difference in overall survival uh, between both arms. So people actually didn't live longer even though their PSA fell more with lutetium PSMA. I think the other important point of this trial, the PSMA radio ligand therapy was much better tolerated than chemotherapy. And so here you can see the progression-free survival on the left, showing that there's some benefit of lutetium PSMA 617, particularly at the tail. Uh, out here at the, the outer months, you can see benefit of patients who have uh, prolonged progression-free survival. But in terms of overall survival, there's actually no difference between the use of cabazitaxel and lutetium PSMA 617. To me, what this means is that I would choose lutetium PSMA 617 over cabazitaxel, not because it's more effective, but rather because it's better tolerated. Patients do better. There's no neuropathy, less lethargy, and people just have a better quality of life when being treated with lutetium PSMA 617. Now, let's talk for a second about use of PSMA PET for selection of patients, because I think this is a really important topic here. So the vision trial and the therapy trial had two very different selection criteria. The vision trial required patients to have uptake greater than the liver, okay? So I have these numbers on the left side. Those are SUVs, they're quantitative measures of uptake. The higher the number, the more radioactivity goes to that tissue. So an SUV of one would mean the tissue doesn't concentrate the radiation at all. Two, it doubles the concentration over even distribution. In this case, this patient had an SUV mean of four in the liver. So to meet criteria for the vision trial, you'd probably have to have an SUV max in your tumor above four. 
Okay. For the therapy trial, on the other hand, it required patients to have an SUV max over 20, a much, much higher uptake than with the vision trial. And that's like priming the pump, selecting out patients who are more likely to respond, more uptake on a PSMA PET, more radiation dose goes to the tumor, more injury to the tumor cells from the radiation, and more response. Okay. Now that's shown by a couple things. So first of all, the vision trial had a much lower screen fail rate, okay? Because they allowed patients in with lower uptake. So they only had a 13% rate of screen failure, whereas the therapy trial had over 30% of patients didn't qualify for the study. Now that also resulted in a higher PSA 50. So patients PSA fell by 50% and only about 45% of patients on the vision trial, but 65% of patients in the therapy trial. So by removing the patients who aren't good responders, they actually had higher response rates in the remaining patients. Higher uptake, more likely to have a response. Now, one thing I like to point out is that patients' disease is very variable, right? We use a PSMA PET to select patients, but not all patients are created equal. So on the left side here, you have someone who has localized disease, only a couple of sites of tumor, in the middle right, you have a patient who has very low uptake, extensive disease, but not very avid disease. And then the other two images show pretty extensive, but different size lesions that are avid on PSMA PET. Now, although we consider this therapy personalized, right, we use a PSMA PET to select patients and give them a therapy that targets that target, it's not really because we're giving all of these patients the same amount of radioactivity. So there's still a lot of work to do to really adjust the administered activity to optimize the treatment for each of these individual patients. Now, in terms of how your baseline PSMA uptake relates to response, there's some good uh, post hoc analysis of the therapy, actually not post hoc, prospectively defined endpoints. And they took an SUV mean uh, uptake measured on the baseline PSMA PET. If you had an SUV mean over 10, then you had a 91% chance of a PSA 50 response, 91% chance. If your SUV mean was less than 10, you had it fell by nearly 50%. You only had a 52% chance of a PSA 50 response. So that uptake is very predictive of how you're going to do in response to this therapy. Now, this was also done for the vision trial. So you can see here, they, they did it differently. They looked at SUV mean quartiles. So they took the lower quartile, upper quartile, and the middle quartiles, and then plotted radiographic progression-free survival on the left and overall survival on the right. And you can see, as you get higher uptake, you have more prolongation of the radiographic progression-free survival. I think what's interesting in overall survival, you can see that there's a batching of the lower three quartiles. And the main benefit is actually in the patients who have high uptake in terms of overall survival. And here I sort of pasted in uh, the, the line for the control arm. So these are patients who receive just lutetium or just standard of care, in essence, nothing. And not can remember, there's no cabazitaxel allowed in this arm. So the main benefit overall survival is driven by patients with an SUV mean over 10, similar to what was seen in the therapy trial. Now, that being said, here's a patient who has relatively low uptake. His SUV max in his disease is 11, right? So that's pretty low. His SUV mean probably measures five or six. is in one of the lower quartiles uh, of those trials. Now, after cycle one, he has a PSA of 304 at baseline. But then after cycle two, his disease, in essence, completely melts away. His PSA goes down to 0.4. I personally can't explain this, right? Some patients are just more sensitive to radioactivity, and we don't fully understand that sensitivity, but we're trying to understand that by biopsying patients prior to treatment, and Felix Fang is working on a correlative study to understand how we measure the sensitivity to radiation in these patients prior to therapy. Because you wouldn't not want to give this patient therapy because he benefited greatly with it. So oftentimes with patients with low uptake, I will say, hey, let's go for it. Let's try a couple of cycles, see how you tolerate it, see how your disease responds, and then we can decide if we want to keep moving forward with the therapy. On the other hand, here's a patient who has an SUV max of 25 in his tumor. Okay, pretty good uptake. His PSA baseline was 289. The SUV mean here is probably, you know, 12 or 13, pretty good uptake. But as subsequent treatments happen, we can see some of the bone disease, for example, in his pelvis actually is getting better, but the liver disease is just not responding as well, and his PSA is already starting to rise. Okay, so patients are very individual and respond differently to the same therapy, and we can actually track that through imaging after each individual cycle. Now, there are also patients who just have PSMA negative disease. So here's a patient who, if you can look on the MRI here, there are these large metastases in the liver, and you can see those correlate with these 
like uh, bright spots in the liver, no uptake, no PSMA uptake in the tumor. And if you look in the therapy trial, the red arm there is the outcome of patients who have PSMA negative disease. And comparing that to the, both the cabazitax and the lutetian PSMA arm, patients who have PSMA negative disease or fail uh, screening on their PSMA pet do much more poorly than patients with PSMA positive disease. Now, one comment about patient selection, again, with Pluvicto. In the package insert, it says that patients should be selected using Locomets or an approved PSMA-11 imaging agent. So it actually states you should use PSMA-11 and DCFPYL should not be used, which is sort of odd. Now, do you have to use PSMA-11 for selection of patients? I believe not. And I think it's important because it's important in terms of patient access. Not every patient has access to PSMA-11, and we need to allow patients to be able to be imaged with DCFPYL or piflufloastat so that they have access to lutetian-based PSMA radioligand therapy. And this is supported by data like this. So you can see the liver uptake here is nearly identical between PSMA-11 and DCFPYL, and so they should function nearly identically for patient selection for PSMA radioligand therapy. Now, at the end here, let's talk a little bit about some clinical trials. In general, most of these trials are moving lutetium PSMA 617 earlier in the course of disease in patients with prostate cancer. So the first trial here is the PSMA 4 trial. This trial is taking patients who have metastatic castration-resistant cancer and then who are progressing on abiraterone, enzalutamide, darlutamide, or apalutamide first-line androgen receptor target therapy and randomizing them to getting a second androgen receptor target therapy or lutetium PSMA 617, so moving pre-chemo in the MCRPC setting. And this has completed enrollment, and we look forward to seeing the results of this next year. There's also two other registrational trials evaluating exact, exactly the same trial design, the SPLASH and the Eclipse trial using lutetium PSMA INT. So there'll be a lot of drugs available in this space soon. Then there's the PSMA addition trial, which is taking patients who have metastatic castration sensitive cancer at presentation and randomizing them to receive either ADT and abiraterone or ADT and abiraterone plus lutetium PSMA 617. So this is moving it up into the upfront setting uh, in the castration sensitive space. There are also a number of combination studies, DNA repair pathway inhibition, for example, PARP inhibitors like the LUPARP trial, immunotherapy trials combining pembrolizumab or ipinevo with PSMA 617, chemotherapy trials, a dose of taxol plus PSMA 617, and then maybe the most interesting trial is the ENZA-P trial, a trial combining enzalutamide and PSMA 617. This one interesting to me because there's a lot of great PSMA pet correlatives in the study. One trial I want to highlight is a trial out of UCSF combining PSMA radioligand therapy with immunotherapy, uh, which Wuhu Agarwal is a principal investigator on with Larry Fong. And this is looking at if we take a single dose of PSMA radioligand therapy and then use immunotherapy, pembrolizumab along with it, can this prolong the response of patients? Now, we're just evaluating the results of this, but here's an example of a patient on the trial, low volume disease, but very PSMA avid. Patient then gets treated with one cycle, right? Only one dose of PSMA radioligand therapy. His PSA was 13.9. And this was his PSA over the two years after treatment. So single dose had a near complete response in his PSA and is just starting to creep back up uh, earlier this year. And his post uh, imaging two years out on treatment, his PSA was 0.5 and there's no evidence of PSMA positive disease. This is obviously not normal. We don't see this very often. Uh, and so we're obviously very optimistic and hopeful that something like this could be beneficial to patients. And we're looking forward to our follow-on trial with Rahul is leading here at UCSF in the near future. The last thing I want to note is that really a multidisciplinary team is key. Now, obviously, I think nuclear medicine and medicology are particularly important, but it actually involves a lot of other people, nurse navigators, palliative care, nutrition, urology, genetics, radiation oncology, a huge team together to treat for these patients uh, and really provide the most optimal care. And we're lucky here at UCSF to have such wonderful people in all of these different areas to work with to help really provide the best care to the individual patients. So in summary, first, PSMA radioligand therapy is FDA approved and is now standard of care in patients who have metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer after chemotherapy and androgen receptor targeted therapy. Two, PSMA PET correlates with response. The higher uptake, the better on average patients are gonna do, but patients should still be selected based on the vision criteria, uptake greater than liver, because even patients who have lower uptake can have remarkable responses as I showed. Lastly, there are a number of clinical trials evaluating treatment earlier in the course of disease and combination therapy, and really participation in these trials is key 
absolutely key for us to move the field forward so that we can learn how to use PSMA PET more effectively in the future and really provide patients with specific beneficial care that will prolong their life and improve their quality of life. So thank you very much.